Hey, well, good morning, Journey Church. How are you this morning? Good. I'm excited to be able to gather with you all today as we worship the Lord. Um, I was thinking uh, this morning um, just about our series that we're in. We're in a, a beautiful series called Redo, looking at the book of Ruth. And I was just thinking about Jesus's ministry and what he got accomplished in three years. He, wrote, he rewrote so many people's stories over and over and over again. He gave people second chances. Now, just thinking about the woman at the well, right, who was looking for love in all the wrong places. She had been married five times, and she just couldn't get that part of her life together. And she has one encounter with Jesus, and her story is completely rewritten. And then a guy who was born blind, he has one encounter with Jesus, and his story is completely rewritten. And over and over and over again, he meets lepers and rewrites their stories and takes them from the outside and brings them in. A woman who had health condition that kept her separated from society, he rewrites her story. And I was thinking, man, how many of us need Jesus to come in and rewrite parts of our story? And that's the beautiful invitation of the gospel is one encounter with Jesus changes everything absolutely everything. And that's what the series that we're in is about. So would you stand up with me? We're going to pray. We're going to invite Jesus into our lives to continue to rewrite our stories. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for all that you are. God, we invite you to come into this place this morning. Rewrite our stories. God, we thank you for second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. God, would you help us be a people who honor you, who love you, who love radically, who forgive radically, who show mercy and grace radically. God, we are your people. You are our God. Would you have your way with us this morning? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
sang this song last week, and so it might be a little new to you still, and that's okay. But we're going to worship this morning, believing in the promises of God, and that He has spoken good things over our life. Amen. There is a promise that points beyond my failure. There is a still voice to silence all my fears. Even the worst of my mistakes are miracles in You 
chorus again, lift your voice. You hold it all. You hold it all. You hold it all. You hold it all. If you believe that, let's sing it again one more time. You hold it on. You hold it on. All our lives in your hands. You hold it on. You hold it on. It truly is good news this morning. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in our own circumstances, that God holds it all. He's the sovereign king. He's in control of it all. Nothing's catching him by surprise. He holds it all. Can we just give him praise for that truth this morning? Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Um, I want to give just a very special welcome to our online folks. Thank you for tuning in this morning and joining us online. It's great that um, no matter where you're sitting, this morning we're all in this together and God holds it all together. It's beautiful. Now, um, I want to give you a, a couple of things, a couple of announcements, but there is uh, one thing I want you guys to know. There, If you want to stay connected to what's going on at Journey Church, you, there's a one-stop shop. It's journeychurchaz.info, and um, we update that weekly. That's all of our announcements, all of our events, our connect cards, online giving, signups groups, all that kind of thing is at journeychurchaz.info. So you can go there for all of your Journey Church needs uh, on there. Um, a couple of special announcements. One is uh, this is the last week for uh, Journey Group signups. And so we believe that we are better together. We're not meant to do life alone. And so we would love for you to find a group to be able to go on a journey with as they grow in their love for God and the world and one another. And so um, you can jump on there and uh, uh, journeychurchaz.info and sign up for a group. There's men's groups, women's groups, mixed groups. There is a group for you. There's a place for you to find belonging. Um, there's Zoom groups, in-person groups. There's all kinds of things for you that are there. The second thing is, is um, coming up on Friday, September 25th, we have a parents' night out. We know that this season, especially for parents, has brought unique challenges and frustrations. And as parents, you probably just need a break, right? You are with your little ones all day trying to navigate technology and teachers and all of that stuff. And so we wanted to serve you and create an opportunity for you guys to just get a break. And maybe, um, maybe it's spouses that want to go out and grab a bite to eat together without uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the crying and questions, interruptions, or maybe you just want to grab a book and a cup of coffee and lock yourself in your bathroom or whatever, and just have two hours of quiet reading. It doesn't matter. You can come here from 5:30 to 7:30. drop off your kids. It's $5 and we feed them pizza, watch them movies. We'll tire them out. And then uh, you can have a little night out for, for yourself. Um, the, the final thing is we have a very special guest coming with us on September 27th. He's going to be teaching in for our Sunday morning service. And um, his name is Brendan McDonough. You, you might not recognize the name, but he's actually pretty famous if you've been around Arizona for, for any amount of time. He was the lone survivor of the Yarhill fire that took 19 lives uh, a, a while back. And he went through um, a crazy time. It was traumatic in his life. Um, it was one of the darkest seasons as his life of being the lone survivor of that fire. And it was in that tragedy that he had an amazing um, experience with God. He met Jesus in some profound and new ways. And so he's going to come and talk about what does it look like for God to take a broken hero and make him whole. So this would be a great opportunity to invite your neighbors and your friends. You are not going to want to miss this service. So you can join us September 27th. Now, you guys ready to get back to our series? We are starting week three. Yeah, you guys can clap for that. Excited, so we're gonna continue to worship uh, through the study of God's word. But before we do that, take a look at this little bump.
Good morning, I'm Carlisle, one of your pastors here. I love this series. Uh, I think that Ruth is one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. It's been one of my favorite books for years. I told you a couple weeks ago that when Tina and I got married 35 years ago, I still remember how, wow, how long ago that was and that the vows that I made to her, I recited the verses that Ruth recited to her mother-in-law to Tina that day. So it's been a, a favorite of mine, but I love this even more so going through this series right now, this time in my life and this time in the life of people all around is a blessing triumphing over oppression. You know what's so cool about God and what's so cool about the Bible, God's Word, is that it's fresh any time that, that we look at it. There's something new for us. I've read Ruth so many times and I've loved it for so many years, but there's still so many new things and I've been getting so excited even as I was contemplating Ruth chapter 3, where we are at today, and what to share with you about that, what God was impressing on me. Tina and I had a conversation in the car, I think it was last uh, weekend, and I had a question for her. Uh, it was a question that I had an answer for because I had been thinking about it. I always put her on the spot when I ask her these questions because I expect her to have like this profound answer because usually she does have profound answers, but she needs some moments to think about it. And I was like waiting and waiting. The question was this, and I want you to con contemplate this question. If you could do some time travel, I know it starts weird already, doesn't it? If you could do some time travel and go back and change something in your past, what would it be? What would it be? If you could go back to your past, do some little affecting the future thing and try to change it up, what would you do? It was a fun conversation for both of us, and, and we had similar answers. I was actually surprised by our answers, both of us, our answers, because the, we both said something about if we could go back to affect the past and change it, that we would change some things for other people. Aren't we something? Aren't we just like the best Christians ever that we would think of others first? But that is what we thought about. And this is, it's not that we're a bag of chips, all that in a bag of chips. It's just that we've lived enough life with each other that we know that the things that affected us that we might want to change are the things that actually changed us. Did you catch that? The things that you might think we'd want to go and manipulate and avoid, we wouldn't want to manipulate and avoid because those are the things that actually changed us, the, the pain and the pride in things. God has used those things to change us, the suffering and the successes. We've been changed by those, the challenges and the victories. All those things have changed us, and, and we just want to sacrifice those things because those are the things that God has used to change us for the better. And we also know that all those things that have come into our life, that if we told you stories, you might think, man, why wouldn't you want that changed? We know that they have passed through the hands of God. Kind of an important analogy for you today that I want you to grab onto, this analogy of passing through the hands of God. It's not like it passed through like if there were sand, the sands of time, and like they slipped through God's fingers and he's like trying to catch stuff. That's not what I mean when I say things have passed through the hands of God. They haven't slipped through his hands. It's like the sand came into God's palm because he holds me and he holds you and he holds all of us in the palm of his hand. And he takes his finger and he's, he like is carving a little pathway in the sand. Not that it's slipping through his fingers. It hasn't passed through his fingers. It's come into his hand. And he's carved away. He's led us through these things, changing us into his likeness. And today we'll see that he's actually blessing us as he makes those ways through his, the, the sand of time. Not that it's slipping through. It's not an accident. It's purposeful on God's behalf. I go to a couple of different men's Bible studies. And one I went to this week, uh, last week, and there was a guy in there. He had this profound statement. He said, the way out of our problems is the way through. That's pretty cool. The way out of our problems is the way through, especially if God has carved this little thing in the palm of his hand and he's leading us through. So today, that's what we're going to believe. That's what we're going to read about. We're going to read about a family in the Old Testament, some people, some main characters that we've been introduced to the last couple of weeks, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, and how God was carving away in his hand for them. He was in the palm of their hand. So we'll do a quick review before we get into chapter three. In week one, we saw that God is always up to something good, always up to something good, even when we can't see it, even when it's super painful, even when it's terrible, 
God is always up to something good. Last week, we looked at that. God is always kind to us, no matter what our failures have in the past have been, our successes in the past, what they've been, what our missteps have been, our good steps, that he is always kind to us. And today, here's our main thought. God's blessing is activated by our faith. Do you believe that to be true? Do you believe it to be true? Activated by your faith. I can tell you stories after stories after stories that have proof for that just in my life. I, um, a couple of the best ones were when I, before I became a pastor, when I was in the secular workforce, and Tina and I were uh, becoming past, I was becoming a pastor of a church plant someday, somewhere. We didn't know where. It was very ambiguous. And these two opportunities came where I could go this way to uh, develop my career in the secular workplace, or I could burn some bridges, like light a match and burn some bridges and cross the bridge into ministry two times. We chose to light the match, to burn these opportunities that were developing. It didn't make sense in a lot of career uh, aspirations that I, I was gaining momentum. Things were coming together. And to light a match and burn that stuff up didn't make sense. But God was carving this way in the sand in the palm of his hand, and we felt led by that. And so our job during that time was to not know how it was going to work out because it didn't make sense. We didn't know if it was actually when and how it was going to happen. We just knew that we were being called into ministry. Our job was to be faithful, period, just to take God at his word where he was leading us, light the match, and walk across the bridge. And for us, two times within just a couple of months of each other, within hours of us lighting that match, acting out in faith and crossing that bridge, things suddenly came together things that I didn't have control of, things that I couldn't have the strategy for. They just came together. That's what our faith with God will do. Now, there's some things that we're going to see today that were pretty similar to that situation, like right away God was faithful. But I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things, some quick cautions about this following God and lighting the match of the bridge and walking across. First thing is this. When we take these steps, we should be really careful to know that it's a bridge that God's asked us to cross, that it's not something that we want for ourselves, that we haven't gone to God. It's like steeping tea. It needs to be steeped in prayer. It needs to be steeped in conversations with each other, with God, and with God's people. So first thing, be sure that it's God's asking when he asks, when you think that you're supposed to burn that bridge and cross it. Number two, God's plan will never, ever lead you to sin, ever, God is righteous. God is holy. God always is righteous. He will always lead you to righteousness. His little carving in the sand is not going to go, and then do this sin so that you can come into righteousness. He uses sin, but he will not ask you to sin. So that's number two ground rule when you burn a bridge. Number three is you might not get an immediate answer. I was bragging to you about within hours, everything became clear and things that were beyond my control came together. That may or may not be the case for you. So don't go out today and, and do something dramatic without um, trusting that God's leading you to it, that it's not sinful, and that you might not get an answer today. It could be tomorrow, so at least wait the day out. So I'm going to read chapter 3 to you. I'm going to read the whole thing again. It's just a great story. I'm going to make comments as we're going through. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to chapter 3. It's going to be up on the screen as well. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your plan. We thank you that things don't slip through your hands, that things come into your hands, that we, our life, your plan, are in the palm of your hand. And as we pursue you, as we trust you, as we act faithfully towards you, things will become clearer and clearer. Thank you that we see this in this story. And God, talk to us about the things that have led us to this day as we're hearing from you in your word, that we would go away today, either online or in person, go away different because of your spirit and because of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, chapter three. So then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well for you? So if you remember, she had been exposed to Boaz gleaning in the field. So she's saying he could be the guy. This could be the guy. I know that I'm supposed to be all bitter and stuff, but she was getting a little bit excited. This could be this kinsman redeemer, this person that maybe you could end up marrying. 
Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? So these young women were gleaning. She happened to be in that part of the field that Boaz was at that moment. So now Naomi kind of kicks into strategy mode herself. You know what a yentl is? A yentl is a, like a Jewish matchmaker. So she's yenteling right here. This is what she's doing. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Put on your cloak and go down into the threshing, threshing floor. So she's just saying, so Boaz has seen you when you've been a little sweaty and a little dirty. She worked really, really hard, harder than anyone else. You remember that from last week? And she's going, you know, a girl's got to do it. A girl's got to do it to make a good impression on this guy. So clean up a little bit, Ruth, and then continue to do these things. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So she says, don't, don't rush it. Don't be too hasty. Don't be too forward. Just kind of go with the flow. Go with this process that I'm telling you about. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So she's being submissive. She's being obedient. So some context of the threshing floor, some things here. First thing, the threshing floor is like this community building that uh, communities would build a threshing floor. And it, was, it would be similar to a, an, a barn that was open at both ends and only had the walls on two sides so that air could rush through. So as they were throwing the weed up in the air, the chaff would throw away, would blow away. So there weren't a bunch of these buildings in the communities. It was like a building. And so you would like sign up for your time to be there. So that's what Boaz has done. He has signed up. Uh, he's there who knows how long, a couple of days for him to to do his harvesting with all of his employees. So it was like kind of a working camp out. They were camping out for a day or two at this community place, and then they would vacate it, and then the next uh, people would come in. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law commanded her. So she's following instructions, the process that that culture was used to. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, a little caveat, this does not mean he was drunk. There is a word for that in Hebrew. It is not this word. That's not what's happening here. He's not getting drunk, and she's coming in when he's drunk. He's relaxed. He's settling down. The harvest is almost done. They're getting it harvested. It's like this deep breath of contentedness, like probably the last night before they're done for the year. The harvest is done right before he falls asleep. So he's, he's happy. He's content. He's relaxed. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and then she came and softly uncovered his feet and lay down. Another thing, this was not seduction. This was not sexual. Sometimes people go, mm-hmm, uncovered his feet. It was actually his feet. It really was his feet that um, she uncovered. She was putting herself in a position of humility. That's what she was doing. That's what servants would do at those times at their masters. They would stay the night at the feet of their masters to be at their beck and call as a servant. She was submitting herself to him in that way. This is not a, a hinky-panky thing. And then it says several hours go by. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who are you? So it's kind of dark. People are sleeping. He's been asleep for a few hours. He was very relaxed. You know, when you wake up and you can't remember what day it is or something like that, that's what's going on here. And he says, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. In other words, would you please be my kinsman redeemer? So she was kind of like saying, will you marry me? She's kind of like proposing to him, will you take care of me because you're my kinsman redeemer? And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, meaning that she was laying at his feet to be his servant, and that you have not gone after young men, rich or poor. So not only did you put yourself in this position of humility, but I know there's better looking guys, and I know these guys are looking at you because you're a noble woman and she probably looked pretty good, especially when she's all cleaned up. Uh, and he's saying, you could have picked these other guys. And you're, you're picking me? And he goes on, and now my daughter, do not fear. So he's showing probably an age discrepancy. He calls her daughter. He was probably closer to Naomi's age than he was to Ruth's age. I will do all that you ask. For all my fellow tansmen know that you are a worthy woman. She had a reputation. She had a, a good reputation as a hardworking woman who is coming into the knowledge of their God, being a part of their community. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. You're right. I am a kinsman redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than me. 
So Boaz was probably the nephew of Elimelech, her father-in-law. There was probably like a cousin maybe in the, the community that was closer relative, that would be a closer kinsman redeemer. He says, remain tonight. So he was already protecting her. He was already looking out for her. Don't, don't walk home in the dark. Just stay here tonight and we'll protect you. Uh, there's, there's men out there. He had already protected her once in last, the chapter last week when he told the men to leave her alone when she was gleaning. And in the morning, if he will redeem you, this other one that's closer to you, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, he's making a solemn oath, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So she lay down at his feet until the morning, but arose before anyone could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor, not because he was ashamed, not because it was scandalous, but because he was going to follow the customs of the day and do some business with the, the town council, so to speak. And he said, we'll see that next week. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So he starts to take care of her some more. So she held it up and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. I looked up how much that could be. It was probably like six handful measures. If it was a full measure, it would be like 60 pounds, which means she was not only attractive but buff, which is a possibility. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter, being the little yentil that she was? Then she told her mother all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So there's four things that I want to go over with you that I think are good lessons for us to take from this as we extend our faith, as we cross those bridges, as God carves out the way in our lives in the palm of his hand. First one is this. Use the system you are in. If you're doing a redo and you're thinking about it's time to change some stuff up, access the system. Use the system that you're in. You don't have to create a new wheel to bring about change in your life. You don't have to make a new wheel. We see all kinds of processes and systems that were in play already in the story. There were guidelines from God about widows, the whole kinsman redeemer. For instance, God was looking out for widows and for orphans all through the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. And so there's some processes and systems that God had already put into play. There were customs of the day, the gleaning thing, the uncovering of the feet. He knew what that meant. Having a town meeting to process this kinsman redeemer that we're going to see next week. Those were all kinds of systems in play. And they used the systems that were in play. And I encourage you, as you make changes in your life, to use the systems that are in place. Some systems all around us are set up by God. Some systems are set up by your families. Some systems are set up by our government. Some systems are good. Some systems are outdated. Some systems are bad and sinful. But most systems are improved upon when you jump off of the system rather than creating a brand new system. Kind of like from within, you make these changes. So even when you create a new wheel, you're creating a wheel because of the concept of the wheel already exists. You get my drift? You don't have to make it up. Access what's already there. So put on your seatbelts. I might offend some of you. Uh, it's only going to be like a minute. So only be offended for a minute. If you need to email me, email me. But we have this thing coming up in November called the election. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about scripture. Did you hear what I just said? I'm talking about a perspective that Scripture talks about politics. I'm talking about Scripture. Let me read a verse to you. Romans 13, 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority sand in the palm of God's hand except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. I just read Scripture to you. So in this process that a lot of us are giving importance to, getting worked up about. We get to evaluate the process that we're within. We get to evaluate and make a decision. If we want to, we can cast a vote about this process and about our decision. We get to undertake this process. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's an exercise of our civic free will. That's a perspective. All rulers don't accidentally slip through the hands of God. It says that. It doesn't, God doesn't go, oh, I didn't mean for that person to get elected. God is carving out 
history for us, even in the way that people come into power. So let that scripture, as, as you have conversations, let that perspective season your attitude about the season that we're in as we come to November. Let that perspective season your choice. Let that perspective season your tolerance if your friend votes differently than you. The election that's coming up is not the decider of all things. God is the decider of all things. Do you get that? God is the decider of all things. So let's trust God with what he's carving out. So there's my little soapbox. Send me emails if you think I crossed over into politics. I was talking about scripture. But let's get back to you. Let's get back to you and God's plan for you. Number two, engage the process. Engage the process. We saw that Ruth did that. What she did, she engaged it. She just asked him, hey, dude, why don't you be my kinsman redeemer? She just said it. She just engaged the process. So here's the encouragement. As we know what God's leading us into, as we see this pathway being carved out in the palm of his hand, don't be passive. You know what I hear a lot these days sometimes? If it's meant to happen, it'll just happen. If it's meant to be, it'll just happen. And I say, mm, I don't know if I can buy that um, partially. But according to Scripture, according to my life, according to a lot of your lives, I know the biggest things in life, the most important things in life, the things that are more than moments, things that are more than incidents, things that change the trajectory of my life, were things that God said, here's a bridge, Carlisle. You get to cross it if you want to. Here's a match. You can light the bridge on fire if you want to. Those are choices that I was able to make, and I engaged the process. One of the lines I like to say all the time, your responsibility is your responsibility. You get to respond to the choices that are given you, and we have to step forward. We have to get on to that bridge. You remember two weeks ago I told you about a screensaver that I had on my computer when I very first became a pastor. It was from a devotional, and it said, God's plans will move forward with or without me. He involves me. He invites me into those plans because he loves me, and he's growing me. But I have to engage the process. He puts them out for me, and I decide whether I'm going to make a move or not. So engage the process like Ruth did. Number three, be humble. Humility is really kind of the, the sub-theme of the book of Ruth. There's all kinds of humility going on. Naomi, in, in this section particularly, she was a little bit bitter, remember? She changed her name to bitter. But she's actually being very humble to this process that is taking place. She's accessing their culture, their times. Ruth, she's certainly humble. Boaz, he's humble. The community, as they receive them back in, is humble. God is even humble as he's inviting them into this pathway that he's carved out in the palm of his hand. Uh, I saw a commentary about this, the word for humility. I love it. It can, it can come from a word that means it, uh, a horn comes from the core of a word horn, like a rhino horn, if you think about a rhino horn, and it's like a lesser horn. Does that make sense to you? So it's like, your prom like a prominent thing about you, like my horns right here, but it's saying don't show off your horn, subdue your horn. So it's unpretending and unassuming. In other words, not being less than you are, but not being more than you are. You understand that? Not being less than who you are, but not being more than you are. Moses is a good example of that. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, he, he's believed to be the writer of this. Moses was the most humble person that ever lived. Isn't that humble? See, he knew what his horn was. He knew that God was using him to lead people. And he was talking about what was him. So God made you to be who you are, but be humble with who God made you to be who you are. So are you trying to be more that God wants you to be these days? As um, you think about parenting, for instance, are you trying to be the super wise parent that happens to be the super wise teacher when you never knew that you were trying to be a teacher and you're struggling trying to be more than God designed you to be? Be humble about that. Maybe uh, in your marriage, you want to be the super spouse and you never want to be uh, not understand your spouse and you never want to have a bad day and you're just trying to be everything to your spouse 
when God is supposed to be everything to your spouse. Maybe in your friendships, you're trying to not be the friend that whoever disappoints and you put all this pressure on you to be the best friend forever when that's who Jesus is supposed to be, not you. Or an employee, you're trying to be the best employee and you're trying to never make a mistake and you get all bent out of shape if you make a mistake. Be humble about what you bring to the table. I think that this next, though, this next thing, though, is maybe a little bigger. Are you being less than God wants you to be? Are you trying to put a little face mask over your, your horn because you're trying to hide it? You're trying to subdue who God wants you to be, maybe with apathy because you're, you're just apathetic about it, maybe because you're weary, maybe because, like Naomi was, you're bitter about your past. I think that during this time in history, in our history, right now, COVID stuff, that we have the opportunity, all of us, to retreat into less than God wants us to be. I've seen it. I've done it. To shrink back. No, there's, this is the time in all of our lives where we could get away with it. We could shrink back because COVID has given us the opportunity to shrink back and to be less than who God wants us to be. We could stay there. We could not move on. We could get away with it. Let's not do that. Let's keep moving on to what God has for us. So humility is as much about stepping up as it is about stepping back. And for a lot of us during this time, it's time to step up and stop stepping back. Number four, watch for the coming blessing. So Boaz, cool dude, his life was good enough. His life was at least comfortable. It was probably a little more than comfortable if you've picked up on the story. He was probably pretty rich. He had land. He had employees. Things were pretty good in his life. He had influence in his community. He was looked at as a wise man even before he did this noble thing about there's a kinsman redeemer closer. But in this conversation that they had, did you pick up on the little thing that was maybe a little less than a blessing in Boaz's life? The whole, there's younger guys, you, you might want to be with them instead, get married to them instead. I'm, it's so cool that you picked me. So there's like this thing missing from his life that God was addressing. God was blessing him with something that we're going to find out next week as we close this series out that was a big blessing. So here's what I want you to think about. Are you content with good enough, the good enough life? Are you content with mediocrity? What horn has God given you that you're trying to cover up? What is in your heart that gets you all worked up that you're trying to press down and act like you don't get impassioned about something? What takes over your thinking process because you think about it and you start to get excited and you're trying to press it down? What is supposed to be more that you're only letting be mediocre? And maybe God's inviting you into something bigger and different for you. So message is almost done. I haven't mentioned triathlons. I won't disappoint you. Here's our triathlon uh, analogy. So um, this week, I was thinking about this message, this chapter, and I went to the gym. I was super happy that the gym was open so that I don't have to go running when it's 117,000 degrees outside, and I can go to the treadmill. And so I have this thing happen. I've talked to my coach about it. He says it's opposite of what's supposed to happen. When I run on the treadmill, I run faster. I am not a fast runner. My heart rate goes up. It's hard. It's a weird thing trying to work on it. But when I'm on the treadmill, I have really good runs. My, my pace is faster. My heart rate stays down. And it's supposed to be the opposite. So this is, what I, this is the weird analogy. I don't know how it's going to help me do better in triathlons. So, so we'll just let it go. But here's the thing. This is what I was thinking. When I'm on a treadmill, I'm accessing power that's already moving. Do you get it? When I'm running on the road or on the trail, I'm generating the power. Are you understanding my drift? God has this treadmill, and it's moving. It's moving. And he comes to me. This is how I vision. He says, see this treadmill, Carlisle? This is like your life. This is Journey Church. This is Tina. Get on the treadmill because I have power that's already in movement, power that's already in play. All you got to do is just step on, access my power, and let's do this plan that I'm moving you toward. I was telling Tina about this analogy. She said, yeah, but, but being on the treadmill of life, <laughs> that's exhausting. So I'm not saying get all busied up and do what you can't do. 
do what you're not designed to do. Join God in what he's doing in your life. It's about utilization, not about exhaustion. Sabbath is still an important part of accessing God's plan. So we're not supposed to wear ourselves out. We're just supposed to join God in what he's already doing, tapping into his energy and his resources. Part of the reason we want to do this series is because this whole COVID fog descended on us. It caused our lives to become less than what God would want it to be. But he's teaching us things. And now, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, the fog seems to be lifting, right? We think it's an opportunity for you to step on the treadmill. To not go, yeah, God's moving some stuff along. I, I kind of like to stand in here. I kind of like the, the good enough life. God's inviting us to do something different. He's inviting us to step on the treadmill with faith. A number of years ago, a pastor at a former church I was at used this phrase that, you know, the, the five love languages? It's the way that there's five things that if you speak to me in a certain language, then it makes me feel loved by you. God has a love language, this pastor said. He said his love language is faith. His love language is faith. So what we can do as we move on in this thing is to speak to God in a language that makes him feel loved by us by stepping on the treadmill that is already moving. That's the challenge for us. In faith, would you step out of the good enough life this week? Figure out what God's asking you to do to step on to that treadmill. And remember that he's good, that he's kind, and he's inviting you to step out in faith. Would you pray with me about that? God, we thank you that things don't catch you by surprise. It doesn't slip through your fingers. Our life doesn't do that. Our life could do that if we don't take you up on your offer, if we don't extend faith and step on to the, the treadmill, the things that you already have working out in our lives that you're inviting us to be a part of. God, show us how to be who you made us to be. Help us not to settle for just the good enough life, to be surprised like Boaz was surprised about what's to come that we get to hear about in the next story. So God, as this, this fog lifts, help us to not be hesitant. Help us to go to you about what you want us to do, to step on that treadmill of faith and to move to what's next. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks for being here today. We invite you back next week as we finish up this series about this Redeemer thing. It's going to be great if you don't know the end of the story. It's going to be a great way to end it. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.